I'd like to welcome everyone to the, to the congregation of Grand Pines Church of Christ. We're delighted that you chose to attend with us this morning. We ask if you're a visitor, fill out a visitor's card. Put the collection plate or leave on a pure gift for the men of the congregation so may have regular attendance. As far as our second prayer request, we have a bulletin. There's still a large number of that in the bulletin. Also, please keep recording your prayers as she went <clears throat> to the yard last night, but she is feeling better and she made it here with us this morning. We <clears throat> have all kind of cards and letters, so I'll just kind of just start working through them. As far as upcoming events, uh, Autumn Place will be today at 4 p.m. Uh, the Spring Party slash Fish Fry will be next Saturday, April 11th, starting at 2 p.m. at our house. Parents, please bring candy for us to fill eggs for your children. We have the eggs, just bring candy. Please give candy to Jackie or Cheryl Lynn by tonight. If you can help provide individually wrapped candies or small toy prizes, please give those to Angel by this Wednesday. <clears throat> All money for the fish fry is due by Wednesday. $5 per person, $15 max per family, no charge for children 12 and under. Good questions, see Angel. Have a couple of cards. Some notes I'll read to you. Robert Golden asked for prayers of congregation for his surgery coming this Monday. <clears throat> Thankfully, the prayers for his friend Sandra have been answered. Her surgery Thursday was successful and the tumor was denied. Dear church family, we want to thank all of you so much for the beautiful flowers that were sent to memory of Beth's day. Even more special to us both is all the interest during his illness. Emails, prayers, and love. Thank you as well to those of you who are able to come and give us your support during the funeral. We love you all so much in him, the day family. <clears throat> Dear Christian family, you don't know how much a hard smile today to be able to be with all of you! Exclamation mark. People ask me, "Do you have a Christian family?" And I tell them, "The best. Without them, I can." And they'll say, "Between my mom, Charles, and all of you, I would not be here today." So thank you for the food, calls, cards, visits, and most of all, the prayers. As for when I get to be here, I can be <coughs> in the bed right now. In the bed right there with all of you. Got to see it one Sunday. <coughs> then my computer went crazy and the wonderful Trey Harvell and Jeremy Clarch fixed it for me. So when I have a decent day, I can go back and see the others. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All the love, team. <coughs> as far as our order of worship this morning, our song leader will be Jeremy Clarch. Opening number will be 386. 386. Opening prayer will be by Jackie Bozeman. Scripture reading will be Tyler Easterling. That will come from James 1, 19 through 27. Our lesson this morning will be by Terry Plunge. Heading to the table will be Jeremy Day. And our closing prayer will be by Jim Ezekiel. Reminder, if you have electronics, devices or cell phones, we'll ask that you put those, turn them off, and put them on vibrate so as not to interrupt worship. Good morning. Good morning. As announced, 386. It's in the first class cases. <laughs> First and last, let's sing. Why did the Savior heaven leave and come to earth? He was old, where will his grace would not reach me, because he loves me so.
that you would comfort and strengthen them as only you know how. Father, we are indeed thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy in this nation. And we pray that these freedoms would continue for as long as time to remain. We pray for those who are in positions of leadership within civil government that they would carry out the duties of their office in such a way that you would see fit to allow these freedoms to continue. But if for some reason they should not, we pray that we would always remember that we are to obey you rather than man. We do thank you, Father, for the men and women of law enforcement in this country for the courage that they have and the courage that they display as they provide protection for the citizens of this country from day to day. We pray that guidance and protection upon them. We thank you for those who serve in the military service in this country and we pray that you would protect them, especially those who are serving in Afghanistan and other difficult places. We pray that their morale would remain high, that they would have strength and courage to do their duty from day to day, and we pray that they would remain safe until they're able to return home to their friends and families once again. We pray, Father, thy richest blessings upon all mankind everywhere. We pray for those who are hurting for any reason. And Father, we certainly thank you for those who are present here this morning. We are always thankful for the leaders of this congregation. We are thankful for the eldership of Deacons and for Brother Terry and the work that he does. We pray that blessings upon him as he delivers the message this morning. We pray that each and every one who is present will listen attentively we would apply the things that are presented to our lives that we might be better service in our kingdom. We pray, Father, that you would help each of us as we live from day to day to strive to remember that we are to march to the beat of a different drum, to strive to show a good and proper example to those around us that others may see something in our lives that is different from the day-to-day -day and the humdrum, and people may realize that it is because of our relationship with you, and that people would ask how they might come into a right relationship with you, and opportunities <coughs> might be provided to tell the love story of the cross. We do pray, Father, that as we go through this period of worship this morning, that everything that is said and done would be in accordance with our holy will. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. We'd like to mark the song of invitation to be number 934. Mm -hmm. 934. Once you have that mark, you'll turn to 414. 414. Let's sing the first, second, and the fourth stanza. <coughs> first, second, and fourth. <coughs> Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Thank you. 
James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself. Go. He. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is, right, he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit to visit orphans and widows in the trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You have your Bibles with you? Slow on that one. Everyone have their Bibles? <laughs> We're still in the same place that you had read to you from James chapter 1. It'll be our text of study this morning. We thank the need for those that are visiting with us who are traveling on their way from one place to another. We pray, pray God's blessings upon you as you are traveling. We thank them for those that are from the community that are visiting with us as well. We're also thankful for our faithful number who are here, the place they ought to be on this Lord's day. It is good to see Tina. We have well enough to be out this morning. You know, continue to pray for her as well. Whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty. James is instilling within us the importance of looking at God's Word. The necessity of us to look in it. Not just to be casual readers of it, but be those that are going to listen to what it says. Our text is really going to back up a little bit before what was read just a moment ago by Tyler. In verse 16, the first point is a plea concerning the perfect law of liberty. Do not err, my beloved brethren. God whether it is that he's looking at the text before as far as what's going to happen if one succumbs to the temptations of God, <clears throat> needs to understand, don't make a mistake and don't be deceived. But the way for that to be accomplished is, is that we look into the perfect law of liberty. How are we going to know what's right and what's wrong? How are we going to keep from being deceived Unless it is that we look into the perfect law of liberty. Do not make an error then. How are we going to know right from wrong unless we are those who are going to continue to read and to study the Word of God? It may sound like a drum that is beaten too much, but it always needs to be emphasized of the value of the Word of God. As we think about our resisting temptation and our ability to follow God. We need to be those that are going to look into the Word of God. We come to verse 19. There is an emphasis within this very thought. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. How quick are we to listen to the Word of God? Or are we those that have got everything figured out? We have the answers to all of the problems. Or do we immediately, when there is that problem, or when there is that difficulty, do we turn to the Word of God? In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus told the disciples of His day 
Search the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which do testify of me. Later in chapter 6 of the same book of John, where can we go, Lord? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We've been given the great book. During this time of year, there is emphasis upon uh, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But we need to learn about Jesus every day of our lives. We need to know that there are things that are going to help us to keep us from making those mistakes. As verse 16 says, don't be deceived. If you know the truth, it's harder for someone to pull the wool over your eyes. If you know the truth, it's harder for someone to trick you into doing something that's not right. But when we do not know the Word, when we aren't aware of right and wrong from the Scriptures, then it's much easier for an individual to convince us that there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Uh, surely God wouldn't tell you you can't do that. And so when it comes to this perfect law of liberty, it's not like any man's law that has been written so it might be amended or changed. This is perfect and complete. Therefore, James gives to us this plea, look into this law. The second point that we want to make concerning this perfect law of liberty is found in verses between those that we looked at, that is verse 17. The perfect law of liberty contains for us promises. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. When we follow this New Testament, God seeks to bless us. To fulfill these promises in our lives. Do we understand how good God is? Do we understand how greatly He wants to bless us? And in this, He says, it is every good and every perfect gift. Birthdays come along. Kids enjoy their presence for a few days, if that long, and then they want something else. Christmas time comes and there is a wide abundance of gifts which don't want to be played with first. Sooner or later, they get pushed aside too. You see, in life, there are things that grow old and out of date and we no longer want them. But there is nothing to compare to these good and perfect gifts that God provides for us. He provides for us everything that we need. 2 Peter 1, verse 3, that according to His divine promise, He hath given unto us all that pertains to life and godliness. <clears throat> what do we need? And yet we're continuing to reach to the world and seek from the world and draw from the world good things. We need to understand that it is only through God and our keeping His Word that we find those good and perfect gifts. And some people don't want those things. And they see all that God has provided and will provide, and they say, that's not for me. If that's what it is, then I don't want a part of it. But brethren, we must think the right way and see the right way so that we can understand that nothing else compares to the end. <clears throat> these good and perfect gifts, but only because we have looked into the perfect law of liberty. You see, it gives us a peek at what's there. It allows us to see what's really available. Too often we're going to take this what we can get for right now. Be satisfied with it. Not understanding that it's going to perish, that it's going to be done away with. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why is that true? Why? Because he says it is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the 
prior life that are of the world and they passed away. They're not here to remain. They're not going to stay. They're not going to be continuing. But these gifts that God has given them, no one can take from us. No one can remove them from us. So when James describing this perfect law of liberty, he says, first of all, listen to the plea. Second of all, he said, wants us to know the promises that come from following it. That leads us to the third point. Are we going to listen and do? Then he is, are we going to practice what is said? Be not hearers of the word only. Be ye doers. We need to encourage others to read and study. We need to be examples of that. But it's one thing to read what it says and another to put into practice. James chapter 4 verse 17 concludes that chapter this way. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is seen. That is, it's one thing to learn right from wrong and another to put it into practice. Now, James gives the illustration of a man that looks into a mirror. Any other look into a mirror this morning? Stop and think how many times you looked into that mirror. Do you check yourself out in more than one mirror as you were walking out, maybe the last mirror available? My tie straight. Everything look okay? You see, we understand the presentation of the physical body that we want to look into that mirror. But here it is, God's Word that says, what are you doing? Are you a forgetful hearer or a doer of the Word? Do you simply look into that mirror and forget? And then you go your way? That's the kind of an individual that may sit in pews, service after service. They may understand what it is to become a child of God. They can tell you the plan of salvation. Or it may be that individual who sits in the pews. They know that they need to correct things in their life. They're hearing. But we just forget about it, don't we? From the standpoint, we put something else in its place. Remember that passage earlier, verse 19? Let every man be swift to hear. But then James says it's also got to be put into practice. Are we just that swift when it comes to putting into practice as it is to listening to the Word of God? The Word of God is meant to be that mirror, not someone else. But the Word of God. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Most of us have been in the theme parks where they have had this uh, maze of mirrors or something along that line. When you go in, there are all these mirrors that are bent and turned and shaped. And you look into that and it's distorted. God wants us to look in the one that's right. One that shows us what needs to be fixed and corrected and changed if necessary. But how often do we just simply forget about it? Do we forget? Does something else take all of the place? And therefore we don't look into this law anymore. Be doers. In Titus 1 verse 16. He says that there are many who profess that they know God, but by their works, it is by what they do, they deny Him. Actions do speak louder than words. We need to understand that we can't convince someone that we're a child of God by the number of verses that we can quote when we don't live by them either. Look into the perfect law of liberty and keep it. Do what it says. 
Allow it to be that mirror that is going to say, here is what needs to be changed in my life. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to try to do things differently. James wants us to know when it comes to this perfect law of liberty that there's a plea that it makes. There are promises to be enjoyed. But there is also a practice that must be followed. When you come to verse 26, after looking into that perfect law of liberty, any among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. In a sense, says there's a way of proof. We may see something that looks like something. I set up here as we were waiting for our worship to get started. I observed somebody out in the floor here, and all I could see is just their actions. It looked like that person was a little upset. But all I could see was that pointing their finger. But I don't know what the conversation was. I don't know really what would have been going on. You see, I could say that seems to me that there was a fuss and argument. But I don't know all facts. The way for us to know whether or not there is this proof is to compare it to the Word of God. If any among you seem to be religious. You may have seen the recent commercial, I think it's for the Popeye chicken and chain. And this lady brings out this red stick. I had no idea what a red stick was, but she said, this is how you tell if these uh, Tabasco is ready. It has the same color red that this stick has on it. You hold it up to it and you say, is it right or not? How do we test? How do we prove that someone is a child of God. We go to the book. There is that red stick by which we measure, and it's the standard by which it's governed. First John 4, verse 1. Beloved, try the spirits, whether they be of God. But there are many false prophets gone out into the world. You see, they don't measure up to that red stick. Here there are those who seem to be religious. They're going through the motions and they look like it to a degree. But things just don't match up. Things are not what they ought to be. Why? Because what this person looks like and what he says are completely different. There's the proof. Second Corinthians 13.5 Examine yourselves when you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Have we gone to the trouble of making certain that what we have followed, what we have obeyed, and what we have done is according to this perfect law of liberty? Or can we just go through the motions now? Finally, there is in verse 27, James says, when it comes to the perfect law of liberty, it involves purity. Pure religion. Unspotted from the world. Beginning of the verse, last of the verse, <clears throat> talks to us about the need of having purity that is only available through the Word of God. Verse 18 of the same chapter. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. <clears throat> because this word is pure, what it is going to bring forth is also pure. It is going to bring forth after its own kind, Genesis 1, verses 11 and 12. It is a law that God has put into practice and into our laws of nature. That if when you plant some certain type of seed, that it can only bring forth after its time. It won't bring forth anything different. So we need to understand that we need to have that pure religion that comes from that 
pure word of God. Brethren, that's valuable to us. When we see the end result because of the fruit that is going to be produced. Here he says this pure religion and undefiled means that we are to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. It's outward, but it's also inward. Keep oneself unspotted from the world. As you were getting ready and you looked in that mirror, did you check to see if there were any spots or stains on your shirt, blouse, dress? What would you have done if you had seen that stain? Would you have changed? Would you have tried to clean it? Or you just simply maybe try to hide it now? Unspotted from the world. The world is full of darkness and full of sin as described here. And it is something that if allowed, it will destroy the Christian. Lust when it is conceived brings forth sin. Sin when it is finished brings forth death. Verse 15 of this chapter. Brethren, we need to be those that understand. God wants us to be that bride of Christ. He wants us to be those that are going to be presented in such a way that there's no spot, wrinkle, or blemish or any such thing. How does that occur? In Ephesians 5, verse 25, it is because we have been washed by the water of the world. These people in the book of James have become Christians just like everyone else in the New Testament became Christians. They weren't given something different for them to obey. A different mirror for them to examine themselves in. A different doctrine for them to follow and believe. It was all the same for everyone. Because God is no respecter of persons. Therefore requires each of us. We back up now to verse 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. How important then is your mind? If it contains the words whereby you can be taught to be saved, it is extremely valuable. In Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 39, with many other words did Peter testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. By following the word of God, we can be saved. They are real Christians. Have you taken time to look into this word to see your condition? If you are outside of Christ, you're lost. If you are outside of God, then you are going to an eternal place of punishment. But today that can be changed. If you will receive, that is to obey the word, you can be saved. This word teaches us that one must have faith. This word teaches us that we must repent of our sins. Confess Jesus as the Son of God. And be baptized for the mission of our sins. That's God's plan of salvation according to this word. But this book is written for us as God's children to encourage us to live those kinds of lives that are pleasing to Him. If this morning you're not faithful to our God, if you need to be obedient to the gospel, please come as we stand and
gathered around the table, um, except for special days like Easter. But what a privilege it is for those of us who examine the Word and understand that Christ implemented this not just for Easter or some other special day, but for every first day of the week so that we might remember the sacrifice that He made and so that we can be encouraged by the hope we have to one day be with Him forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the sacrifice that Your Son made that He was willing to come to this earth to live as a man and though He had no sin, to take on our sin at the end and be willing to be crucified for us that His blood might cleanse us from all sin. Father, we thank You so much for the victory that we have. Not only did He die, but that He was buried and rose again. And that one day we can spend eternity with you because of that. Father, we ask that you would help us as we partake of this bread which represents his body to examine our lives and to compare it to your word. Father, we ask that you would help us to do so and partake of it in a manner that is pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. in your thanks. Father, once again, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that your son made and the sacrifice that you made in sending him. Father, we know that through his death on the cross and through his blood, which cleanses us, is our only way to heaven. Again, be with us as we partake of this. Help us to do so in a pleasing manner. In Jesus' name, amen.
supper being concluded, we have at this time the opportunity to fulfill another command, that is to give back a portion of that which we've been blessed with. And after focusing on the victory we have through Christ and the sacrifice he made for us, it should be just too easy to do this part of our worship so willingly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all blessings and we know that everything that we have comes through you. Our life, the very breath that we breathe our jobs, homes, and families, and everything that you give us, Father, we thank you for all of those. Most importantly, we thank you for Jesus, who came and died on the cross. Father, we ask that you be with us now as we give back a portion of those blessings you've given us, that the work of the church might continue here in this place. Father, also be with the elders as they continue to make the decisions they make. Thank you so much again for our blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> you've been blessed by being together. Hope that we can all go away that by and uplifting. We have worshipped our God today. We have <coughs> numerous ones that are on our sick list as far as within the bulletin. We especially still want to remember uh, Sister Peggy Staver as she's been put back on our list again as she again now starts battling this once more. Let's continue to keep her in our prayers. Kirk is up with his mother. She'll be having surgery tomorrow. So a number of things going on that we need to be prayerful about. Brother Golden will be having his surgery tomorrow at Jackson. So let's be prayerful. Don't forget that this afternoon at 4, that we'll be meeting in Autumn Place to sing and study with the rest of the staff. Brother Ezekiel has our closing prayer. If you don't mind, let's be standing. <coughs> Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we bow before Thee once again this Lord's Day, thanking Thee for Your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, it's through Him that we come to Thee at this time, thanking Thee for the wonderful story of life. We're thankful for its blessings and that in which You have revealed through Thy inspired Word. Father, we're thankful for the gospel, its power to save us and to bring everyone to the knowledge of truth. Father, we're especially thankful for the abundance of our material blessings in this country. Father, we realize that all belongs to thee. You're the beginning of all these things and the beginning of thy creation. Father, we're thankful for all the people around the world that labor and toil to provide for us the food we eat, the clothes we have on our back, and the things in which we enjoy. Father, we pray for them and their well-being as we labor and serve one another with these physical, material blessings. Father, we're especially mindful this day for the number of ones on our prayer list with illnesses and upcoming doctor's appointments. We pray for their well-being and that the doctors may be able to diagnose and medicate and to bring them back to a better portion of health. Father, we're thankful for the wonderful hope of heaven one day. We pray that we'll always keep heaven as our goal. We're thankful for the strength and encouragement we get from Thee and from one another to help us to do as we should to so be able to arrive there one day. Father, be with us. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.